Hello, my name is Prabhanjan Anand from UC Santa Barbara and I'm going to talk about secure software leasing. This is a joint work with Rolando La Placa. So the no cloning theorem of quantum mechanics states that there does not exist a universal cloner that given an input, a quantum state, and it, it outputs two copies of the same quantum state. In other words, it says that if I give you an arbitrary quantum state, you will not be able to copy this quantum state. While no cloning theorem might come across as a limitation of quantum mechanics, uh, the principle of no cloning is the basis for many interesting cryptographic primitives. Let us look at some examples. Um, in 1983, Weissner came up with this a uh, brilliant idea of associating money uh, with quantum states in such a way that uh, an adversary will not be able to produce uh, many copies of this money state. This principle has also been um, uh, studied in the context of encryption schemes. Um, you know, you can associate ciphertext with quantum states in such a way that uh, this, you know, you cannot produce two ciphertext that both decrypt the same message as the original ciphertext. This, this concept has also been studied in the context of signatures. So finally, um, quantum uh, no, the no cloning principle has been useful for uh, preventing uh, uh, software piracy. Right? And, and the notion that studied, studied this is called quantum copy protection, which was first introduced by uh, Aronson. And this, this notion of uh, quantum copy protection is going to be the, uh, you know, the, the, the main focus of this talk. Okay, so let's try to understand this problem. Um, so you have a software vendor who uh, is selling their software that they manufactured. So you, you want to make sure that the users who are buying these, buying the software are not illegally distributing this for their own profit, right? And this is the problem we want to solve. So it turns out that classical technology is not very useful to solve this problem. And the reason being that if you represent software as binary strings, you know, this can always be copied. So it's unclear how to sort of solve this problem. You know, so the natural question is whether we can use the no cloning theorem to solve this, right? Like, can we use the no cloning principle to, to, to solve this problem? And the, the, the Aronson introduced the notion of quantum copy protection to precisely address this problem. Okay, so let's see what quantum copy protection is. So let's. Uh, consider a specific example. So let's say there's a Microsoft who wants to sell their software. Um, and let's say the software is represented as a circuit C. So what Microsoft does is it compiles C into a quantum state denoted by rho C and it sends rho C along with an evaluation algorithm to the user. So we want the guarantee that the if you run the evaluation algorithm, on row C and any input X, you would get the same result if you evaluate C on X. Right? So, so in other words, the functionality is preserved even after you do the, this compilation process. So in terms of security, what we want is, suppose let's say there's a user who has gone rogue. So he gets this compiled software from Microsoft and he tries to um, create two copies of the software in such a way that both these copies evaluate to this uh, compute the same circuit C. So in other words, in the first copy, the user has sends let's say row C1 and eval1. Um, and with the goal that if you run eval1 on row C1 and any input X, you should get back C of X. And similarly, he does this for the second copy too. So the intuitive security property we want is that, you know, if the user, um, you know, tries to sort of create these two copies, uh, satisfying these two conditions, then he should be 
they should only be able to succeed with very very small probability right let's say like digital probability right so <clears throat> in this example i consider the case when uh, you know row c1 and row c2 could be unentangled and let's say he only uh, is expected to output two copies but in reality maybe the user gets k copies of the compiled circuit and we want the guarantee that you should not be able to output k plus one copies right and all these different copies could be entangled with each other right so so we want the guarantee that if you evaluate all of them on, on input x the probability that all of them outputs your x is negligible okay so let's make some simple observations about quantum copy protection these observations were already there in the uh, original work of Farenson. So firstly, this notion is impossible to achieve classically as we saw earlier. Uh, the second observation is that this notion is impossible for learnable functions because if you have black box access to uh, the function then you know you can sort of learn this function um, uh, you know by, by running it on many inputs and once you learn the function now you can generate how, how many ever copies you want because you have maybe like a uh, classical description of this function so you can uh, replicate this uh, function many times okay <clears throat> so co quantum copy protection is really like a fundamental primitive in quantum cryptography because you can think about many primitives like unclonable encryption one time signatures and so on as uh, copy protecting very specific functionalities Okay, so what do we know about quantum copy protection? You know, uh, Aronson in, in the work where he introduced uh, uh, com co copy protection, he also came up with the construction of copy protection for all unlearnable functions in the quantum oracle model. This is, our, this is a model where the oracle runs some quantum functionality. And then he, and then in, in a more recent work, um, you know, the, there was a construction of quantum copy protection for unlearnable functions in the classical oracle model. It, uh, in, in this model, you know, the functionality implemented in the oracle is classical, uh, but the queries um, uh, could be superposition queries. That, that could be quantum queries. And these, these two results were in the oracle model. What do we know in the plane model? Uh, in the plane model, we knew of only heuristic construction of, uh, of copy protection for very, very specific functions, uh, namely point functions in the plane model. Okay, so a natural question that was sort of left open since um, Adamson's work was that, was whether we can construct quantum copy protection for all unlearnable functions. And in this work, we show that the answer is no. Um, we show that uh, there does exist unlearnable functions for which com uh, quantum copy protection is impossible, right? And our result is conditional. Um, our, our, it's our result is a conditional because we uh, make use of cryptographic assumptions. So we show that um, there does not exist quantum copy protection for all unlearnable functions, uh, assuming uh, FHE core quantum circuits and also that learning with errors is hard against quantum polynomial time algorithms. Right. <clears throat> yeah, so quantum FHE is just uh, FHE for quantum computations. Okay, specifically we identify a class of functions uh, such that this class of functions is quantum unknowable um, and moreover if given any copy protected state uh, given like a physical uh, physical access to a copy protected state that computes this function we can create new copies of this function it turns out that the techniques uh, underlying the impossibility result of copy protection is also useful for ruling out quantum virtual black sophistication um, so recall that um, classical VVV obfuscation was ruled out by Barak et al. in 2001 
um, and you know you can ask this question whether you can obfuscate classical programs but using quantum machinery meaning that you know suppose let's say you allow for the obfuscation algorithm to be uh, a quantum uh, circuit and let's say the output is a quantum state so if this is the case then can you actually achieve virtual black uh, virtual black box obfuscation and we show that even this is not possible like even if you use uh, quantum mechanics, you cannot achieve uh, the strongest notion of obfuscation, which is the virtual black box obfuscation. And this was also concurrently uh, observed by Alachik, uh, Brokersky, Dulek, and Schaffner. And they rule out uh, quantum virtual black box obfuscation, uh, black box obfuscation under under weaker assumption, just the quantum hardness of LW. Okay, so. You know, so we, we uh, ruled out the existence of uh, copy protection for all unlearnable functions. So you can ask the question whether you can construct copy protection for a subclass of unlearnable functions. So for example, let's say they are evasive functions. And in particular, we are interested in constructions without it, using any oracles. And this seems like a hard problem. Um, and so, uh, we observe that in some settings we don't need this the strongest notion of copy protection we can uh, we can settle with some weaker notions of copy protection and this is what we are going to do right so to understand how we can weaken the definition of copy protection we are going to recall the um, the copy protection setting so so in copy protection the adversary can produce two states um, and along with these two states, the adversary also produces its own evaluation algorithms, right? And um, we want to guarantee that, you know, simultaneously these two evaluation algorithms don't compute the original circuit C, right, with uh, non-negligible probability, right? So you can consider scenarios where the evaluation algorithm, choosing the evaluation algorithm is not under the control of the adversary. Right? Um, so for example, let's say, you know, there's some software that only runs on a specific operating system. You know, of course, the adversary can look at the software um, and create its own open source versions, but we want to make sure that uh, these open source versions don't run on the same operating system. Um, right, so, because if, if the adversary is able to create such a software where uh, a pirated software that runs on the same OS, then this might, um, affect the revenue of uh, the, the company which created the software. Okay, so towards sort of capturing the setting, we are going to introduce the notion of secure software leasing. Um, so in this setting, you know, consider the scenario where the company, let's say Microsoft leases software to a user, and after the lease period is over, the user is supposed to return back the software. And after return, returning back the software, the user loses the ability to run the software again on Windows. So it, in other words, the user does not have any copy of the software after it returns back the software. So we can consider sort of like two leases. One is infinite term leases, uh, where the lease never expires, uh, which means that the user can keep the software forever. The other type of lease is finite term lease. Uh, here, the lease will expire after a certain amount of time. Yeah. Right. So, based on these two notions of leases, we can actually define. We can give two different definitions of uh, secure software leasing. Um, in the first definition, which is called the infinite term lesser security, the adversary cannot produce two copies that both compute the original circuit with respect to the same evaluation algorithm that was provided by the software creator. Right, in, in finite term lesser security, you have a weaker guarantee that, you know, the adversary is supposed to return the first copy. Um, and if the first copy does not, you know, either it is the case that the first copy does not pass the verification check, or if it passes, then it has to be the case that the second copy does not evaluate the circuit with respect to the same evaluation algorithm eval. Okay. okay, so pictorially speaking, you can say that, you know, the user should not be able to produce two different states that 
both compute. See, in the case of infinite term lesser security, but in the case of finite term lesser security, the user is supposed to return back the software. Uh, and after that, you look at whether the second copy computes the original circuit or not. Okay. Okay, so now, um, you know, we, we said that, you know, constructing copy protection is hard. So let's look at this weaker notion. Um, and you can ask if SSL exists for unlearnable functions. And unfortunately, the same impossibility result for copy protection can actually be um, um, modified and can, can be used to rule out finite term SSL as well. Um, but on the other hand, it could very well be the case that building SSL for simple class of unlearnable functions might be much easier than building, let's say, copy protection for um, the same class of uh, functions. And, and that's what we're going to do. So we want to show that there exists infinite term SSL for evasive functions, assuming the existence of um, sub-exponential QLW, um, post-quantum indistinguishability of skaters, and also post-quantum input hiding of skaters. So by evasive functions here, I just mean that, you know, it should be computationally hard to find inputs on which the function outputs one. Right, so it's a few remarks are in order on the assumptions. Um, so sub-exponential QLW just means that the learning with reverse assumption is hard against sub-exponential quantum polynomial time adversaries. Uh, Post-quantum IO just means that IO is secure against QPT adversaries. And finally, we also use uh, input hiding obfuscators. Um, roughly speaking, the security definition says that if I give you obfuscation of a circuit C, then you cannot find an input X as that C of X is 1. And we give a very simple sort of observation that you can construct input hiding of skaters for compute and compare from LW, right? And um, compute and compare class of functions uh, are the following class of functions. It, they take as input X, they compute on X to obtain A prime, and you output one if and only if A, a prime equals A. Right, so, so you're computing something and then comparing with some other hardwired input. Okay, so if you combine this observation, then you can show that there exists infinite term SSL for compute and compare circuits, assuming the existence of sub-exponential QLW and post-quantum indistinguishability of skaters. Okay. okay, so we summarize our contributions. We show that uh, copy protection is impossible to uh, achieve, like even finite term SSL can be ruled out um, from quantum FH and QLW. And then we also give a construction of uh, infinite term SSL for evasive functions. Um, okay, so let's get into the technical details. Let's start with the impossibility result. So the main tool we are going to use is a quantum FHE scheme. This just means that given encryption of a quantum state, they, then you can homomorphically evaluate um, this on any quantum circuit C to obtain encryption of C applied on the uh, original state. Um, the main starting point uh, we're going to um, the, the, we're going to, the, the main insight that we are going to use is from uh, the seminal work of Barak et al, who say that there exists a class of circuits for which um, if I give you a classical software implementing this circuit, then um, you can recover some secret S. But if I give you black box access to the circuit, then you cannot recover the secret S. So why is this insight useful? Um, so we can look at the first bullet and see maybe this might be useful for recovering another implementation of C. And maybe from bullet two, we can use that to prove unlearnability of C, right? In other words, maybe the same class of circuits that they have um, could be used to uh, rule out copy protection as well. Okay, so there are some challenges in sort of implementing this uh, approach. The first one is that, you know, in, in Barak et al, it, it was sufficient to talk about just recovering one secret bit. That was enough, right? Um, but in this case, you know, you're not just recovering, uh, you know, um, just a secret, but you're also, in, uh, you need to recover an implementation of C, right? Like you need to recover the whole, the description of the whole function. And the second uh, challenge is that in Barak et al's argument, you know, they, they 
crucially rely on the evaluator being able to make copies of the software. Um, and this is a problem because in the quantum setting, uh, you, cannot, you cannot do this due to the no cloning theorem. Okay, but nonetheless, you know, we are going to start with the same class of circuits that Barak et al. started off with. And we will see how to sort of address these challenges and uh, modify them in a way uh, that, that handles the challenge that we described. Okay, um, the circuit, the class of circuits we're considering is such that any circuit in this class is parameterized by two values, A and B. Uh, it takes as input X, and if X is zero, then you output encryption of A with respect to the public key PK. And if X is A, then you output the value B. Right, and all other inputs, you just output zero. So this is the class of circuits. So you can show that this is unlearnable. Um, this is done using the adversary method introduced by Ambinus. Okay. Um, so how do we how do we show that this is insecure? So to show that it is insecure, here is what we could do. Um, so we have a physical um, description of the uh, of the of the of the software that implements CAV. On input zero, you're going to evaluate this on input zero to get encryption of A. Um, and then you're going to use the fact that you have a physical description of the software, right? You're going to use this physical description to homomorphically evaluate on encryption of A. Um, and you do that, you get encryption of uh, B, right? Because since uh, Euro C computes uh, C, A, B, um, if you run on A, you have to get B, right? This is just a description of C, A, B. So now, in order to copy CAB, um, all we need to do is uh, recover B. Because once you recover B, you have encryption of A, you have B, and then you're done, right? You also need to recover A, but let's uh, ignore that part for now. But the problem is, you don't know how to recover B. Um, and the reason is that, <clears throat> and the reason is because uh, B and rho C prime are encrypted. So if you want to run the software implementing CAB again, you cannot. The, that software is in, encrypted now. And you only have one copy of this software. So uh, once this becomes encrypted, it becomes unusable. So to circumvent this problem, we are going to use virtual black box obfuscation. Um, so we are going to modify the template where uh, on input x equals zero, you, in addition to outputting encryption of A, you also output an obfuscation of a circuit G. What does this circuit G do? It takes as input to encryption of B and then releases uh, both A and B. So once you do that, you're done because you get this encryption of A and, uh, and obfuscation, obfuscated circuit by evaluating the circuit on zero. And then you're gonna homomorphically evaluate uh, the circuit on uh, encryption of A to get encryption of B, then you use this obfuscated circuit to get A and B in the clear, right? So we used uh, VBB obfuscated, uh, obfuscation scheme in our uh, impossibility result. Now the question is how to be instantiated. It turns out that since the class of circuits that we are VBB obfuscating is very special, we can uh, instantiate it using lockable obfuscation or compute and compare obfuscation. And um, this combination of using uh, lockable obfuscation and quantum FHE was uh, also developed in the context of uh, non-black box quantum ZK. This, this impossibility of copy protection can also be uh, extended to finite term SSO, so it's a stronger impossibility result. And uh, we, use, we can use Aronson's uh, almost as good lemma to do that. Okay, so let's move on to the construction of infinite term SSL. So recall that um, the adversary in an infinite term uh, uh, lesser security definition, it says that it on input a quantum state tries to output two copies, such that both the copies evaluate the same circuit uh, as before. And our goal is to um, construct uh, infinite term SSL for evasive functions. 
So to do that, <coughs> we we use the following insight. Um, so no matter what scheme we come up with, um, the adversary is going to behave as follows. Uh, on input uh, quantum software, uh, either does two things. I mean, either he outputs two copies that both of them are the same as the original software, or it outputs two uh, copies where one of them could be different from, uh, at least one of them is different from the original copy. And the first case is um, more similar to the uh, no cloning theorem setting. So we can we uh, possibly use the no cloning principle to prevent this case. And we can use crypto to prevent the second case. Um, right? and, and to see why crypto here is useful, there is a lit rich literature on uh, non-malleable cryptography. I mean, there's there are many works that sh show that if, let's say, an ad adversary tries to tamper with a cryptographic object, then he can only succeed with a uh, very small probability. Right? And that's why crypto is useful to prevent the second case. So there have been some subsequent works on SSL, um, which are going to appear at CC uh, TCC. Um, so they construct SSL uh, for, um, for, for different class of functions from either weaker assumptions like sub-exponential QLW or even no assumptions uh, with weaker correctness guarantees. There are also constructions of uh, copy protection in the Oracle models. Uh, there was recently a construction of copy protection for PRF's uh, first time in the plane model. Um, some open problems that still remain uh, is that we don't know how to copy protect evasive functions in the plane model that's still open. And also, can you actually rule out uh, copy protection in other uh, Oracle models like random or classes, classical accessible Oracle models? Right? Or even proving impossibility results might be uh, useful here. With that, I conclude my talk.